Pixel Sift is proudly supported by Murdoch University School of Arts, who have been with us since the very beginning. And it's where we learn how to make podcasts, radio and video. If you're interested in a creative degree in game, sound, film, journalism, or maybe you'd like to max, mix and match, you can head to murdoch.edu.au forward slash arts to learn more about what they've got on offer. That's murdoch.edu.au slash arts, or you can search Murdoch University for more information. Murdoch University School of Arts, proudly supporting Pixel Sift. Yes, hello, hello, and welcome to Pixel Sift. I am your host, Scott. And for those of you joining us for the first time, we are a show dedicated to indie developers from around Australia and the world. Joining me tonight is my co-host, Mitch. Hello, Mitch. I'm on this side of the desk. <laughs> yes. Yep, back. Um, and joining uh, our guests this evening are James Coney and Daniel Spateri. Together they are the Pixel Engineers. Thanks for joining us, guys. Uh, yes, James and Daniel are here to talk about their asymmetric multiplayer game, Hunt and Sneak. But before we get to that, Mitch, what are we covering? Yeah, well, it seems like some keen Fortnite players have been going pretty crazy to going to pretty crazy, crazy lengths to get their hands on a promotional skin as part of a recent Samsung tie-in promotion. I think we're going to have to get you to switch marks there, Mitch. I think that yep. one's broken. Is it? Yep. Oh. <laughs> Sounds like you're talking from over there. That's okay. All but right. yes, Fortnite, crazy skins, all that coming up in just a second. Hey Mitch. Yep. You know there is multiple ways that you can subscribe to Pixel Sift. Oh yeah. How's you, that? You could subscribe on your podcast player of choice if you like audio only versions, like Apple Podcasts or Pocket Casts, or even Google Play if you're in the US. Or you can jump on Twitch and you can give us a follow, or on YouTube if you like the video versions. Wow, that's awesome! I didn't know we wanted so many things. Yep, and you will get a handy little notification as soon as there's a new episode for you to watch or listen to. Wow, I'm gonna do that right now. I'm sure you will, Mitch, because you're a good boy. Good boy, Mitch. You know, that You've is... done a nice little uh, covert mic switch. In yeah. The... Um, yeah, I'm over here now. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so... Topic number the first, Mitchell. Take it away. Oh, so, Fortnite players have always been a passionate bunch, but now they've taken their passion to all new levels by actually, well, in relation to a promotion that Samsung ran with the game to have a very exclusive skin only available with their new Samsung S9 devices, I believe. That's, yep. And Note 9. A Note 9, mm. yeah. So this is the latest Samsung phone. The skin in Fortnite was <laughs> directly tied to the players purchasing the phone, and um, you unlock the skin by kind of just playing three games on that particular device. But there are a couple of catches. The device, the skin can only be obtained once per device. But this has led to certain players going to great lengths to get the skin by visiting stores and taking advantage of, of retailers' demo copies. Um, yeah. Yeah, there's heaps of them as well. Like, yeah. There's just a bunch of YouTube videos up of people um, showing themselves going to stores or telling them of their failed or successes. Yep. Uh, it's been crazy. And I think every, the retailers are now... Well and truly onto it. They um, are absolutely That ship onto sailed, it. I feel. Yeah. But yeah, very interesting and very funny. Um, we actually had one of one of our very own um, Pixel Sift friends, friends of Pixel Sift, <laughs> um, ran into uh, his own little escapade. Yeah. Um, we have actually have a clip um, from Yoss's epic Samsung adventure. Dude, this is like the greatest soundbite I've ever collected. Yeah, here it comes. The only way you can either get this skin is you have to access and play three games of Fortnite on a Samsung Galaxy Note 9. So what I did was I was like, you know what? I'm not going to be paying to go and get this phone. So I'm like, all right, I'm going to go into this display area mm -hmm. and uh, access uh, Fortnite and play it. Simple, right? Think of like Metal Gear Solid alert music in my brain <laughs> and then accessing a hotspot on my phone. Yep. And then connecting the phone to my hotspot. Yep. And then downloading Fortnite. This is like a store where only two people are there. And there's only like one person every half hour coming in, you know? Right. And we have to say that um, he, <laughs> it, Yoss didn't succeed in that. He did not succeed. Um, to 
the full version of that story, which is even more funny than that clip, I probably will post that somewhere in the future. But uh, spoiler alert, he does end up getting the phone and he ends up paying for it. <laughs> mm. So we do make fun of him for that. He's a big Fortnite fan, though. He's a massive Fortnite fan. James and Daniel, have you ever, what lengths have you gone to get uh, some bonus material or some content? Is this up your uh, alley? Yeah, I've, uh, <laughs> I've done a, a few things. It's, uh, probably the best examples is uh, a few of my mates. Um, I suppose when it came to uh, sort of similarly, but uh, when Halo 4 was uh, first released, they released a, a limited edition Halo 4 console. And uh, if you bought the console, you unlocked uh, a unique armor, uh, the Photos armor, I believe it was called. Um, so, you you know, I had friends go out and buy, you know, a completely new console just to get this uh, this unique armor, uh, which in my opinion looked a bit ridiculous. Was like, <laughs> well, we can safely say this this skin does actually look pretty cool. I'll, yeah. I'll give it that. Um, um, it oh, it just it the when I so yesterday when this topic actually came to us after the fact that story was told to me, and I thought, oh well, I guess yours might be the only one that made this connection, but. Um, I decided that I'd go to my uh, local JB Hi-Fi and try and do this. Yes. And unlike yours, who creeped around a phone for about almost an hour <laughs> and waited for his opportunity to do this, I asked the dude, I was like, look, I'll be up front with you doing this story about the Fortnite skin and I would like to try it. And he goes, well, that's perfectly fine. You can totally do it. Just letting you know someone's already done it on this phone. And oh. I was like, oh, okay. Well, <laughs> that was that was where it ended for me because I'm not going to... And I just and I realized after the fact that you need to play three games of Fortnite, which is I don't like doing that anyway. So I people, was, you have to win. You don't have no, to, no, no. You, you have just to have win. to play. So I mean, it's probably within uh, your interest to like die straight away. You know. Mm. Yeah, definitely. I mean, the idea of something for free drives people wild, and like if it's exclusive or bonus mm. or rare, then it's even wilder. You know, like think. Uh, and this doesn't, I don't think this matters where you are from in the world. Think if you have a Krispy Kreme, when that opened, I'm sure it was crazy. Yeah. Every time the iPhone yeah. comes out, crazy. Like people just go nuts. The, actually, what's that store that opened in Perth just the other week? Uniqlo? Yeah, that's the one. So you can buy all the stuff that they sell off of the internet anyway. Yeah. But huge lines down, down the mall last week for that. I, that I don't understand. That that mm. that's, a, that's a puzzle to me. I think the closest I've ever come to actually doing something similar to this is when Destiny had a um, a promotion in the original game where you could buy a Red Bull and then you'd get like a Red Bull themed speeder in Destiny. And there were people in and the promotion was not available in Australia, but you could you could totally get a Red Bull can if someone would buy one for you in America and send you the code from it and you could redeem it in Australia. So Australian accounts could obtain the content. <coughs> and I was I was like talking to people on Reddit. I was um, calling up my American friends, and I didn't end up. Get, I didn't end up doing it because I just lost interest almost immediately. Yeah. Um, if you've just tuned in, we are talking about how Fortnite users are using display phones in stores to get an exclusive skin that's just come out, and it is only available for a very small amount of time. I think it clocks out in December. Um, and as Samsung is onto it as well. Um, they are not happy about people trying to do this. So <laughs> they're onto the new strategy and have started putting up warning signs just not to do it. That's their strategy. Yeah. Um, the company don't want to see players doing all this uh, to grab an exclusive skin, especially if it can be such a personal data risk. Um, some recent reports have suggested that we might see the new Fortnite Galaxy skin lose its exclusivity in the future. Um, so that would be a uh, very... Um, many saw people because of that, I think. It might actually make me buy something in Fortnite if that comes out and it's just available for everyone. I want to, like, take the power away. I wanna, I wanna, I'm totally going to buy it. Yeah, well, <laughs> <laughs> like I said, we do love free stuff. Uh, I know that every time the that free Mars bar giveaway thing run comes uh, yeah. out, I'm, like, buy thousand percent more Mars bars than I usually do for no good reason just because I like to win uh, and there is like a you know psychological background with this there was a there's a Duke University professor and author Dane, Dan Dan uh, really states that even when faced with numerous choices people will always choose the free one regardless of its economic value uh, many things have pros and cons but the free option makes people forget the downsides 
And that's that that kind of implies to this situation. You know, the downside of getting a free skin. Yeah. It's not free. You spend yeah. not only the like, you know, the the trouble of having to go in stealth or uh, metal gear as um, <laughs> Yoss did and try and get it done, but you also have to waste you know a good amount of time because the, the the download for Fortnite was like one point four gig or something. Yeah, it was off of a phone, I assume. So there might even be personal data. You know, nothing in this world is free. I think listeners. Also, <laughs> there's like a sense of adventure that I think some Fortnite players are finding pretty sexy. Like they're like, oh, <laughs> went to sexy. This- yeah. Okay. <laughs> like they just like oh. I've gone to this store yeah. and it's no, it's like, a challenge. I've, it's good. I, yeah, it? it's a good, great story. It's almost like they've it's the flavor of the month. It's like if you manage to do this without buying the phone, it's like your own little victory royale almost. It's like that <laughs> same button that's pushed in your brain. It's uh, yeah, it's your own personal winner chicken dinner. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> Um, I mean, that's probably as much time as I want to give Fortnite again, yeah. as we constantly seem to be doing this week. I already give um, it too much time on a Friday. Very so. funny, um, <laughs> especially because our friend Yoss purchased um, one himself, which they're, they're not cheap. Yeah, full disclosure, he totally got a new contract on his phone and he ended up getting the skin. And he's very happy with his Android. Yeah. Um, <laughs> You need, anyone else that wants to uh, rush in and get your chance, don't get uh, get your skin. Don't get an X demo model. I would say, yeah. Uh, and you know, <laughs> you have to just free yourself of like fifteen hundred dollars, and you'll get it for free. All right, next topic. You're listening to Pixel Sift, or you might be watching Pixel Sift on Twitch. Pixel Sift. That is right. You are listening to Pixel Sift. I am Scott, and we are up to our interview portion of the episode. I am joined by James Coney and Daniel Spateri, and they are from Pixel Engineers in Melbourne. And tonight they've joined us to talk about Hunt and Sneak, which is a comfy couch multiplayer about a spooky dark game of cat and mouse where you traverse the depths of a murky cave and roam the abandoned halls of an aging manor, escaping the clutches of the ravenous gobbler and chasing down those pesky pixies. And of course, like I said, we're lucky enough to be joined by the team behind the game, Pixel Engineers. James and Daniel, thanks for joining us again. Hey, guys. Uh, Now, that was a little press kit rendition of the game. Uh, Would one of you like to give our listeners, especially the ones that aren't viewing uh, with visuals, a rundown of the actual game, the gameplay? For sure. So the game is, um, it's a game about where you are set in a realm filled with mystical creatures and you you play either a gobbler or a pixie and the goal of the gobbler is to gobble up all of the little pixies and the goal of the pixies is to run away from them and escape them. But you're invisible, so you need to use your light ability to be able to navigate navigate your surroundings. So... That just makes it extremely hard, especially when it's uh, everyone. Everything is all seen on the the one screen, and it makes it really fun and on on the edge of your seat type of gameplay. Uh, so, how many people can play this game at once? It's four people. Yep, love a good couch multiplayer. It's our favourite thing here at Pixel yeah. Sift. <laughs> so, um, nice. the game is relatively asymmetric. Well, it is asymmetric, not relatively asymmetric. Was that a difficult? Um, was that were those mechanics difficult to construct? That was a bit of a challenge um, from that perspective. Uh, just sort of yeah, keeping in mind that uh, everyone's going to be on the on the same the same screen. Um, but you know that's what uh, what we set out to do was sort of really create a an experience that could be enjoyed by you know a group of friends uh, just hanging out um, or you know at a party. Um, so really just aiming to sort of bring people uh, together in the sense that uh, you know we want them to. Uh, you know, get the most out of the game and really enjoy it. Yeah. And we're not letting the um, screen size affect it. We're actually making a custom camera system where it'll be able to move around, follow all the different players and zoom in and all that sort of thing when it gets close to the action. Um, so when you're near the end of the round and you've only got the last two people left, zooms in and the music gets really intense and it makes for a really fun the last couple of seconds. <laughs> fun and frightening. Um, yes, so definitely with all the spooky of, music. Yeah, exactly. Uh, on that, actually, oh, while we're on the music, um, yeah. who who worked on the soundtrack? It is uh, suitably frightening. It was Jeff Dunn. Fantastic, and it, it was—is that just yeah. the soundtrack or the actual um, 
sound design so he's, as well. He's done, he's done all of the, all all of the sound effects, um, and he did that last year in about two weeks before PAX 2017. Mm. And so this year we've given him a lot extra time. We've actually mm. given him two months' notice, which is probably pretty crazy for him when he's almost all the other freelance work that he does. Everyone comes to him like a week, two weeks before PAX and goes, oh, we need, get, we need sound for our game and <laughs> we need it now. Um, and it, besides, the obvious, well, I was about to ask who is in the team. So the two of you and you've also had work uh, help from uh, James Dunn, was it, I believe? Um, who else is? Yep. Audio, and then we've got Chang Su, he's the artist. Yep. Made really amazing art and that sort of thing, all the visuals. Uh, so where did the inspiration for the game come from? Did you like see something on the side of the road that really inspired you or any particular media? <laughs> so this game initially was conceived at a game jam and it was an extremely hacky version of the game where we've got like so the lighting system from the Pixies was actually made with 10,000 lights. So we turned them on and off, little spotlights. Whoa. And so that was extreme, extremely laggy. But... Um, what really inspired me about it was that people were really enjoying that gameplay of being invisible and not not really knowing where you are and having to, you know, get a shock when you're like, oh, I thought it was over there, but, you know, I'm actually over here now. So you've got to really adapt to it and learn the map and that sort of thing. It makes it really fun. We've got a uh, question from the chat from Moody Zander. Uh, he asks, or th- they ask, I'm curious over how other players navigate, seeing how the stage seems dark and only the light are from objects or the gobbler. Uh, so, yeah, the pixies have their own light. So they press A to activate their ability, uh, their, their ping ability, and then that lights up the whole area around them, and then they use that to navigate. But obviously you have to use that very sparingly, otherwise the gobbler will be able to track you down very easily. Love that dynamic um, mechanic. Sorry, uh, and was this game at? We were talking about this earlier. I'm sure I'd played played this game or at least seen it. Um, but Mitch was unsure. Uh, PAX 2017. Yes. Yes. I just yeah. I don't think we got around to talking to you unfortunately, but I do remember playing it. It was very cool. That's good. Yeah. So what's what's changed since PAX uh, PAX 2017? Have you added anything? Oh, so um, much. Pretty much everything. So <laughs> the game now has networked multiplayer. Um, We've got that new camera system that I was talking about. We've got two new maps. We've got a forest. And then now we're working on a castle-style map. And um, then we've got at least three three new pixies and three new gobblers. And the gobblers each have their own abilities, and so do the pixies. So it's really, really expanded content-wise, and we've just kept the core cool gameplay there, all the, the fun gameplay mechanics, and kept that there. So how long have you uh, all been working on the game? Uh, so I've been working on the game with Chang since the start of 2017, so about a year and a half, and then Daniel came in um, at the start of this year for it's the design and that sort of thing. Been available as an early access demo demo since February of this year, um, and there's been a few devlog updates since then. Um, how has the first six months of launch been, or soft launch? Uh, it's been pretty good. We've got quite a bit of valuable feedback and that sort of thing. Um, as initially, the game was was extremely dark, but we've actually made it um, a little bit easier to see, like the outlines of the rocks and the walls and that sort of thing, by adding a a fog effect. Right. And that just makes this that little bit easier to sort of see um, or plan where you could go. Yeah, we had some very valuable feedback come through uh, through the demo on the uh, on our website. Uh, we put that to uh, to good use. So uh, yeah, like James said, um, you know, making it a bit a bit easier to uh, sort of navigate um, because yeah, the the darkness uh, came up a little bit. So uh, it's probably one of the major changes we've made. Um, so obviously, just putting on the content has been our main goal for this year. Sure. Um, I got another question from the chat. Uh, Moody Zander asks again: uh, Won't Pixie players who memorize the map? Have advantages by not use by not being by not needing to use the ping system. Mm. You could definitely do that, but even I get stuck on on corners sometimes. So, <laughs> as someone who's played the game for a year and a half, you can still still get caught out because you're completely invisible. So you just sometimes you don't realize you might have you know been off at a little bit of a more of an angle than you thought, and then yeah, yeah, I guess navigating in darkness, you can only yeah. be so confident. 
So what? Yeah, and also with all the new abilities that the the goblins are going to be able to get, one of them's a sort of like a, a night vision one where it like turns everything their lights green, and then you're able to see like through walls and that sort of thing. You're able to see the pixies through walls, whereas normally you wouldn't be able to. And so it's adding all these little. When you talk about uh, stuff, when you talk about memorizing the map, actually the thrill of the chase makes it uh, really intense. So. You know, when you are moving out that as a pixie, when you sort of enter into the line of sight of the gobbler, um, you know, you, you sort of drop your marbles, you sort of uh, <laughs> cut loose and sort of running this, this way and that way. And it's very easy to sort of lose your lose yourself as you try to uh, navigate. Panicked escapes and mistakes are plenty. Yes. And jukes. <laughs> Lots of jukes. <laughs> uh, so what are the plans going forward uh, with the game? So the game's going to be released in uh, six weeks, and then we're also going to PAX 2018 again in Melbourne and show it off there and there. So we're launching game in six weeks. So that's our plan. Very exciting. And is there anything? Yeah. So is there anything you're str- scrambling to add or anything that you're scrambling to polish before before launch? A lot of polish to do before launch. Yep, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we want it to be. Um, you know, as solid as possible by the time mm. uh, launch comes around. So, yeah, um, so fixing up all the uh, all the maps, doing lots of debugging, <laughs> making sure that everything's fully functional and uh, there's ample content to go uh, when we do launch. And what's the home stretch been like for you so far? Like, uh, we we do talk to a lot of game developers on when their betas come out or when their game is already out. But what does it what does it feel like now to be to be this close? Pretty intense. I think it's a constant 100% stress level. So there's no <laughs> point in the day where I'm not worrying about that I should be doing work because I do a full-time programming as well. So I've got to come home you know, almost every night and then every night on the weekends working on the game and <clears throat> making sure we, we're able to get it past the mark. Uh, now, I believe this is the first release or the first game for Pixel Engineers together. Um, have you ever, uh, as a crew, worked on any games in the past? Uh, we did work on a game. Um, we attended uh, Melbourne, which is the Academy of Interactive uh, Entertainment. Um, in fact, all, all three of us, uh, James, myself, and uh, Jing, we were all, in the same, uh, all doing the same course. Um, towards the uh, end of our second year, which would have been the final year of the course. Uh, I worked with James on a uh, survival horror game, um, which unfortunately uh, never saw the light of day. Um, <laughs> but uh, it was really it was really something really, uh, really intense. Uh, sort of uh, set aboard a uh, spaceship that had gone adrift and you played as the lone survivor and uh, being pursued by uh, mutant creatures on board the ship. I'm noticing a pattern here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we have another question from Moody Zander on the chat. Um, he would like to know, how do you design the balance? The short preview seems to put the players, other than the gobbler, at disadvantage by virtue of having no idea where the character or uh, where they're going. Well, really, we're hoping the, uh, the abilities will sort of balance uh, it out quite a bit. Um, we're still fine-tuning them. Um, but uh, they are coming along. So uh, that's just one of the efforts we're sort of making to, uh, to sort of put the ball at, you know, in the park of the Pixies um, so they don't feel like they're completely helpless. Um, it'll definitely assist them in uh, sort of making those uh, quick escapes when they have to and uh, just add to the overall uh, dynamic of gameplay. Yeah. We'll also be getting a few QA testers in to test the game. I- my younger brother, don't have, don't have to pay him, so I can just <laughs> get him in and do some testing and that sort of thing. Get that family and slave labor in. And a few other more professional people in as well. Uh, um, so if you... Uh, sorry there. No, you're fine. Uh, I was just going to say, if you've just joined us, uh, you are which, listening to Pixel Sift, of course, the gaming interview podcast live on Twitch. Uh, we are talking to James Coney and Daniel Spiteri about their game Hunt and Sneak. Very excited for the launch. Six weeks. That's uh, that seems pretty pressing. Usually, we speak to people, um, and if if the game is kind of coming out that quickly, there's at least some kind of something going on uh, as far as the marketing or the lead up to it on the internet. Um, but 
There's a, there's no um, alluding to late lo- launching in six weeks anywhere on the internet at the moment. So there's actually a, um, a Skype interview bad. right after this interview. Oh. We'll be speaking to our marketing team. Nice. Right. Um, so that's going to be Oof. coming out in the next couple of weeks. So you heard it here first. Six weeks. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Pixel Sift exclusive. Room. World, world exclusive. That's right. Like I, <laughs> it, it does... It does interest me, like, once a lot of game developers that we talk to, um, they find that game development is, like, one part of the process, but then the rest of it is almost like the marketing and business management. Um, what's that been like for you guys to learn? Yeah, it's been uh, very much stop and go, um, which is the reason why we've brought some uh, professional marketers on. Uh, up until now, we've been sort of handling the uh, the marketing in-house, uh, yeah putting up uh, the website, uh, maintaining a, uh, a bit of an online presence as much or wherever we really could, uh, updating our uh, our blog whenever we could, I suppose. Um, yeah, just trying to sort of maintain that. So it is uh, it did sort of fall in second to actual uh, work on the, uh, on the game. <coughs> uh, it has been challenging, but, uh, yeah, well, hopefully you'll see a lot more of us online uh, now that uh, to brought in the big guns. <laughs> it, has, it has been a very big um, a big thing for us was uploading the game to itch.io and Game Jolt, sharing a demo to those pages. It's got quite a few people looking at it and downloading it, so that has been very good to get exposure and that sort of thing. And, um, yeah, it's just been a massive learning process. I mean, the website initially is nothing like now it is, like it is now. It's a lot, a lot cleaner, like a lot more good screenshots and all that sort of thing, and... Uh, the text and all sorts of things is getting better day by day. Well, if people do want to check out um, your wicked content that is available out there, uh, where's the best people for? Uh, where's the best place for people to go? You just go to huntandsneak.com. Cool. Uh, for all your updates, yeah. all the games, all the everything, and everything going forward, um, of course, six weeks, and you can cop it all for yourself. Uh, that is yep. about all the time we have for in this episode. Uh, we will post up all the information of where you can get the games if you've missed any of the uh, uh, details along the show. Thank you for joining us for another episode of Pixel Sift. Uh, big thank you to Daniel and James. Hey there. Oh, wrong one. <laughs> this one. Big thank you to Daniel and James for spending some time with us this evening and telling us all about their game Hunt and Sneak. This episode was hosted by myself, Scott Quigg, and of course, Mitchell Lowe. Hey! It was produced by the fantastic Fiona Bartholomeus, and of course, let's not forget our executive producer, Gianni De Giovanni. I mean, we kind of still think he works for the company, but he hasn't been around in a while. He's around, he's around. He's in the books. (laughs) Uh, Thank you very much to Murdoch University School of Arts for for supporting Pixel Shift through all the 104 episodes. If you'd like to uh, learn more about a great creative degree, go to murdoch.edu.au forward slash arts. As always, we'll be sticking links Topics, uh, links to topics we talked about in the show notes on our website www.pixelsift.com.au the absolute best thing you can do is head to pixelsift.com.au forward slash discord if you want to keep up with everything we're doing we post everything there first and you can chat to us about what you're playing articles you've read or share the cool work you do um, we've also got other social media pages as well like twitter facebook instagram just search for pixel sift and mitch if people want to listen to episodes other than this one, where should they go? Yeah, so it's on. It's also on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Pocket Casts, and yeah, wherever you get your podcasts, pretty much search Pixel Civ and our yellow icon will appear. That's it. While you're on a pa- Apple Podcast, if you could give us a review and a star rating, that would really help uh, to find our show. Um, that's all. And thank the you. next show will be on the 20th of September. That's true. A uh, big thank you to James. A big thank you to Daniel. And we're out. See ya. <laughs>